Good morning, my three colleagues. How are you this morning? Um, by way of introduction, we do have two executive sessions um, after our briefing, and so if I can impress upon you the need to be a little brief this morning, it would be helpful. All the, and we also have a briefing from the hearing examiner on um, a, a, the lid issue, the waterfront lid issue. So um, having said that, it never works anyway, but I keep trying every Monday. Uh, let me just give, give a brief uh, report from the Governance, Equity, and Technology Committee, and that is we have no items up for both this afternoon. We have our meeting tomorrow morning at, at 9.30. We have two uh, items that will be up for vote. One will be the Soto BIA legislation, which has come up to our committee before, and that should be prepared to vote, and I think a lot of you are familiar with that, Soto BIA activities. And then the uh, second piece is the surveillance update legislation, which uh, we've been discussing for several months, um, nearly a year now, and I think we've reached a great compromise, both meeting the needs of our need to use technology and balancing those needs with the concerns of many privacy advocates, including the ACLU, and so we think uh, all issues have been resolved, and so that will be up for a vote as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Councilmember Sawant. Thank you, President Harold. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. There are three items on today's City Council agenda from the Human Services, Equitable Development, and Renters' Rights Committee. They are appointments, Lori Goff, Devin Silvernail, and Marcy Tate Lamar to the Seattle Renters' Commission. One is a mayoral appointment and two are commission appointments. Last week, we held our last committee meeting before the budget, so the next regular scheduled meeting of the committee will be after the budget deliberations in December. And I also wanted to share that we will be, my office will be hosting a coffee event to welcome District 3 constituents to discuss housing affordability, renters' rights, and other issues that may be of concern for them. This will be co-hosted with a Squirrel Shops, which is a coffee shop in the Central District on Saturday, September 22nd, starting at 10 a.m. And so I invite uh, all the D3 constituents who may be avidly listening to the council briefing 9.30 a.m. Monday morning <laughs> <laughs> or may, may, may watch later uh, to come and join us there for a discussion. We will also be inviting other organizations who are uh, helping to uh, organize renters and people who are struggling with housing to come and speak to the constituents as well and offer their services, you know, exchange information and so on. So congratulations to the Tacoma Education Association who went on a very courageous nearly a week strike action and had a fantastic rally last week that uh, I, w I had the chance to join them at. This was uh, phenomenal. They had a solidarity from the American Federation of Teachers, Teamsters, SEIU, many other unions. It was uh, really quite empowering for the workers there, for educators and other workers there. And they won a very strong 14.4% way, wage increase. This morning, the Seattle Times has an article on the various uh, strong contracts that teachers unions, educators unions have won throughout the state. And they're asking the question, how will the state pay for this? Well, it's very simple. Close the corporate tax loopholes, tax big business. You will raise more than enough funds to pay for the basic needs of educators and students throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Schwann. Councilman Bryan. Thank you. The Sustainability and Transportation Committee has a couple things on the full council today. We have three appointments to the Move Seattle Oversight Committee and two appointments to the Seattle School Traffic Safety Committee. Um, we also have a committee meeting tomorrow at 2 p.m. here in Chambers. Um, in the committee, we will be discussing uh, some appointments to the Citizens Advisory Board for the Sugary Beverage Tax. We will be hearing updates on implementation plans for a variety of modal boards, so the freight master plan, implementation plan, the pedestrian master plan, implementation plan, and then a progress report on the bike master plan, implementation plan. And so just as a reminder for folks, um, these are uh, multi-year plans that are in place, but we have a process where every year there's an annual update to um, kind of a five-year implementation plan that's rolling, and it's looking at what are the projects we're going to be working on in the next year or two. Um, so that we have some clarity about what are the uh, priorities or what are the opportunities that come up. So we'll be hearing on all three of those. Uh, we will also um, likely be voting on legislation around pre-tax benefits. And so um, we've had a number of conversations about this. And the idea is, um, again, pre-tax benefits is the IRS code allows for 
um, employees to have the cost of their transit passes, amongst other things, deducted on a pre-tax basis from their employers, hence saving them um, payroll and income tax on that, which could be about you know a 30% savings in the cost. Um, employers also get a, a savings because they don't have to pay um, employment tax on that, which is a seven or eight percent savings. Uh, but it can only happen if the employer um, is willing to do that. And so we're, what we've been talking about for almost the past year now is um, a process where we would make it a requirement that employers offer that to employees. And the legislation that we currently have in front of us, for those that haven't been tracking this closely, um, would require that businesses with over 20 employees um, offer their employees this option. We've been working closely with Commute Seattle. Um, uh, we helped fund some additional outreach for them last year in the budget. And they've been talking to um, mostly small to mid-sized businesses. The larger businesses typically already are required to do some of this work through commute trip reduction programs. They're pretty aware of it. But making sure that smaller mid-sized businesses understand the opportunity here, frankly, because it really is an opportunity. And we're hearing a lot of good feedback from some of these businesses where they can save some money and provide a benefit to their employees um, through this tax savings. Um, and you know, it's a competitive market out there. And so employers are often looking for how can they attract and retrain, retain employees. Um, the, the current legislation says that this would not take effect until July next year. And then enforcement would just be education for another year. So there's almost a two-year period before there would be enforcement. Um, a number of other cities have done this, uh, notably San Francisco Bay Area, Washington, D.C., New York City. When New York City implemented this, um, in the first 18 months, they had, I think, eight complaints. So it's not an overwhelming body of work. And all of the complaints in New York City were resolved by... Um, someone talking to the employer and explaining how to do this. There's a variety of ways to meet the requirement that are low cost, no cost options that are almost always more than offset by the tax savings to the company too. So um, uh, we make we may be considering some amendments to change the, the, the timing of that to give a little more flexibility for a little more time for folks to take effect, but we'll have that discussion tomorrow on committee. Um, two other things really quick. We'll have the first discussion on a potential vacation, a street vacation uh, for a, a Nissan dealership. Um, it's down in Airport Way South. And then we'll get an update on the tra Traffic Incident Management System, affectionately known as TIMS. Um, reminder, um, the uh, fish truck turnover a few years ago on the viaduct um, had kind of massive traffic implications citywide. And at that point, SDOT went back and um, essentially created a more robust system for how they respond to traffic um, incidents like that. Since that was first put in place, there have been a couple other incidents. And so we'd asked for start to come back to us and say, hey, what have you learned? How's it, is it working well? Are there tweaks you made to it? So that's what the update will be about. Great. Mm, very good. Interesting. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Councilmember Bagshaw. Thank you. Uh, I've got a number of things today on the committee, but I, this, is this on? No. Nope. The little green light is on. Can I borrow? Yeah. Thanks. Um, that sounds better. Uh, so I've got a number of things that I'm reporting on from Finance and Neighborhood Committee, and then some things I want to uh, acknowledge and say thanks to our waterfront and uh, civic group around Belltown and our Pioneer Square efforts. So first of all, I'm also reporting for Deborah Juarez. Uh, and by the way, uh, Council President Harrell, Deborah, and I joined thousands of others yesterday to celebrate the storm's victory. And I, I'm glad that we were there. It was a great opportunity. And talk about here come the storm. You know, it's one of those days where you had sunshine and then it was pouring rain just before everybody was let in. So we were glad to have, be inside together, but congratulations to the storm and to, all, to the fans and everybody who participated in that. So first of all, from Deborah Juarez, there's no full council agenda for her civic development, public assets and native communities. The next civic development is going to be this Wednesday, September 19th at 2 p.m. And they're going to consider two bills for Hinghe Park, Bush Hotel, and then an RCO grant application resolution. Now, for those of you who don't have enough meetings on your schedule, uh, we are also having a special committee meeting this Wednesday, the 19th at noon for the Finance and Neighborhood Committee. So it's going to be a fun field afternoon on Wednesday. And we're, of course, getting ready before the budget. Um, 
five items today from finance and neighborhoods. Um, the two major ones that I hope that you will all know we're already about, we are looking to appoint Calvin Goings and Andre Mattia to uh, their new positions of F FAS and Department of Neighborhood Directors respectively. We will be adding the expectations letter as always. You know, we go through these things and then the expectation letter is finalized. So I'll just have to be um, amending the appointment today, but you've all seen that. You've had an opportunity to give us input and I appreciate that. We're also selling an S-stop property uh, to Dunn Lumber, which is off the Burke Gilman Trail, Cascade Bicycle Club and pedestrian um, organizations and neighbors were there in support of that last week. So you'll be seeing that and we have an appointment of Leanne Kim Doe for the Community Involvement Commission um, and also um, Karen Kubo Fleming for Community Involvement Commission. That's today. There are 14 items on our committee meeting on Wednesday, so we're gonna try to move that forward um, and move it quickly. Most of it's appointments, but we do have a few other landmark controls and su supplemental ordinance for budget and the quarterly grant acceptance Wednesday. Okay, so the two things that I've, I am wanting to say thank you for, um, Marshall, I, I know you're here now, but we put together over uh, the community in Belltown a weekend long event where they invited the community to talk about what do you want to look next at Belltown. And a number of you will remember that um, and some of the Belltown leaders wanted to do something called recharge the battery, which was to take the tunnel and do something like Paris and other cities have done with abandoned tunnels. It turned out to be just simply too expensive, not feasible, but they have gotten themselves back together and looking at what can they do on top of battery, but also there's a two acre parcel that Washdot will be using for staging during the Battery Street um, when they're, they're filling it, frankly, with rubble. But the community's coming together saying, what can we do with that two acres? And they've got a great idea. I think, Marshall, you talked about having a lung, which is green space down there. Coincidentally and totally parallel, the community is looking at an orchard, at additional pea patch expansion, at just green space. And I think that what they are, the direction that they're going is, is feasible. It's not going to be, you know, the $2 billion. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars rather than in the millions and billions. But I'm really uh, wanting them to get together and get coordinated this year and we'll be back to you with that. Um, and then also thanks to the Pioneer Square Group, the Courthouse, DESC, others were looking at what we're calling Yesler Crescent. Many of you will already know about it. We'll be doing a lot more of it and especially my at-large friends um, in the next weeks and in the budget, but it's looking at improving the courthouse property, which we did during the summer across the street in front of DESC, down the little triangle property that is called Prefontaine Triangle, and then across to Fortson Square. There's some very great opportunities. People are coming together around a coordinated way of making that happen in the next year or so. All right, that's it. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Beckshaw. Uh, just for a reminder for Councilmember Skeda uh, Brisas, we have a, both the Waterfront um, Local Improvement District, the, the LID uh, presentation after, we have two fairly lengthy executive sessions um, this morning. So, and having said that, we're at the halfway mark. So I wait just for the halfway mark, and Councilmember Mosqueda, you are up. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning. There are no items for uh, today's okay, full council. Okay, Councilman Johnson, you're up there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no items for the, from the Housing, Health, Energy, and Workers' Rights Committee on today's full council agenda. That said, I do have a resolution that we will be bringing forward. Resolution 31838 is being passed around now for your um, review. This was also introduced um, officially on the council's in, uh, website on Friday. I uh, just want to make sure that folks have a sense of what it is that we're passing around. As many of you know, I've worked with the union community for a very long time and specifically the farm worker community, working with United Farm Workers um, over the last almost decade to make sure that we're improving working conditions. What we've seen from individuals throughout our state um, who work in the dairy
very industry is that many of these workers face um, very intense uh, safety concerns. Uh, you may have heard of Randy Vasquez, who in 2015 died in a manure pond because there was no uh, safety provisions protecting him from driving into that pond at night. These individuals work uh, around the clock and they work in very unsafe conditions. We've heard situations of harassment, intimidation, retaliation, wage theft, people being forced to work off the clock, individuals not having um, facilities, bathrooms, hand washing facilities, et cetera, and many cases of um, sexual harassment and intimidation as well. I bring this up not because we have a number of dairy farms in Seattle, but we do have one of the largest dairy um, industries in, uh, located right here in Seattle with um, Dairy Gold. And we want to make sure that from the top to the bottom, we have responsible employment practices that we promote here in Seattle. This resolution uh, calls for us standing in solidarity with farm workers and asking those who work with farm workers or contract organizations who employ these farm workers to live by the standards that we've set here in Seattle, which is good living wage jobs, protection from harassment and intimidation, making sure that people have important safety protections and uh, upholding the wage theft protections that we put into place. Um, given the headquarters here in Seattle, um, I thought it was important to bring this resolution forward. On uh, this week, you will see many farm workers beginning a five-day strike, or I should say a hunger strike, to make sure that this issue is really brought to life. Obviously, this is something that we've worked on here in the state for a number of years. It was back in 2015 when Randy Vasquez um, died in the manure pond. A year later in Idaho, a similar situation happened. So where we have responsibility to ensure good supply chain economics, um, I think we should take the opportunity to do that. So this is one resolution that calls for our support uh, in, in solidarity with those workers. I also um, look forward to any questions that you might have. Happy to connect you directly with United Farm Workers or any of the workers, the dairy workers themselves. If you haven't heard some of those stories, happy to share that. The next Housing, Health, Energy, and Workers' Rights Committee will be um, coming up this week on September 20th at 9.30 a.m. We will be reviewing the Yesler Terrace Annual Report and Office of Housing, Race, and Social Justice Report and Action Plan. Those first two items will take about uh, 30 to 40 minutes, and I'll take public comment on those two pieces first, and then we're going to have the opportunity to hear again from Deborah Smith, who is the mayor's appoint, uh, appointee uh, to potentially serve as the general manager slash new CEO for Seattle City Light. So you can anticipate that we'll start taking public comment for that second of our two um, hearings around 10, 15, 10, 30, and we'll spend the rest of the hour talking with Deborah Smith. If you haven't had the chance to review our housing health Health, Energy and Workers' Rights Committee um, tape from last week. Uh, Councilmember Juarez and myself asked a number of questions over about a two-hour period, and um, I appreciated her honest responses. You can find on our website as well, uh, seattle.gov backslash issues, a, a link to her questionnaire. As many of you know, because you all submitted questions, we submitted tw 34 questions questions to Ms. Smith. She responded um, to 20 of those with the commitment to respond to the latter half this week. We will send those around to you. You all should have a very beautiful binder that our staff created, and we will walk around the hand-printed copy as well. Um, just for your um, uh, memory, we are going to be talking about energy conservation, environmental justice issues, ongoing conversation about workers' rights, um, and uh, workplace culture in this upcoming meeting. So I hope you'll join us um, for any part of that upcoming meeting. Uh, Council Member uh, President Harrell has asked us to be brief, so I will close up with some things on the horizon here. <laughs> we have um, really great news um, coming out of la end of last week. Council Member uh, Gonzalez and myself had the chance to be with the workers from Unite here, Local 8, as they were taking their final vote on whether or not to strike. You may have seen information um, across many states where Hotel workers from Unite Here who work at the West End Marriott have decided to strike with a 98% um, vote, which is very impressive. Um, I know a lot of us are used to going to the West End for many activities and events, and we will honor their strike and make sure that their voice is uplifted and heard. 
Uh, today I'll be um, sending our congratulations to Farida Cuevas from my staff, who I believe will have to go speak on my behalf um, because of, of all of our executive sessions. Congratulations to the folks at uh, Rainier Beach Safeway who've partnered with Fresh Bucks um, and really excited about that partnership and wish Farida Cuevas all the luck out there speaking to the community about the importance of that program. Tomorrow I'll be attending the Real Change Breakfast in the morning, bright and early. Hope to see many of you there. And speaking at the Magnolia Community Meeting event in the evening. On Friday, I'll be um, welcoming our new um, uh, president of SEIU 775. Um, very excited uh, to be um, celebrating all that David Rolfe has accomplished and really excited to be welcoming in Sterling as the new president. And then um, this Saturday, I have the chance to attend a delegation um, trip to Germany with the AFL-CIO. The AFL-CIO has invited about 20 electeds at various levels of government um, to create a bipartisan delegation to go and talk with individual electeds in Germany and union members there. Germany has one of the highest unionization rates. It is some, an issue that is not political, and they have some of the, um, I think, best safety protections that we can continue to learn from here. So I look forward to reporting back um, how that trip goes. Um, I also just want to take a quick second to say thank you to Council Member uh, Bagshaw, who through your committee and through your chairmanship has helped us uh, get the uh, second piece of land disposition policy out of committee unanimously. I'm really excited to be working with you on this policy that preserves public land and public hands to build affordable housing. If the city decides that they are not going to build public land or public housing on that land, then we want to work in partnership, especially with those community organizations who are at the highest risk of displacement to make sure that affordable housing gets built along with public amenities like child care facilities, health facilities, um, community spaces, and open public green spaces. So thank you for your support on that. Excited about the unanimous um, vote that came out of committee, and we will have that in front of full council on October 1st. And with that, thank you very much, Mr. President. Good. Thank you. Councilman Johnson. Thanks. Um, a couple of items on today's introduction referral calendar today. One of those is the resolution um, regarding council's preliminary decision on the University of Washington major institution master plan. Um, we will be considering this document uh, at our committee discussion on Wednesday morning. And this is just my chance to remind all of my colleagues that the UW MIMP is a quasi judicial manner. And so council rules related to ex parte communications do apply. Um, I'll also be uh, walking on a resolution that we talked about on Friday at uh, the special committee discussion on uh, Key Arena. The resolution effectively, as, as I uh, mentioned to my colleagues on Friday, is going to ask for some reporting back from the various different departments that are working on Key Arena related to the transportation projects that are going to be invested in as a result of uh, the Key Arena redevelopment, both by the development itself as required by the state's Environmental Protection Act and the um, MUP that will issue on that project, and then other city capital investments in the neighborhood. So no vote on that today, but walking that on to INR in the hopes that we can take a vote on it the following Monday, uh, the 24th, when we take the uh, rest of the transactional documents up. Happy to walk uh, my colleagues through uh, some discussions and look forward to having you back, Councilmember O'Brien, so we can get your imprimatur on that. Uh, we do have a, a, a PLEZ committee meeting on Wednesday, and we're cognizant of Councilmember Bagshaw's committee starting at noon right behind us. Um, so we're going to be starting at 9 a.m. that morning. So make sure to remind my colleagues of that early start time. And we've got a busy agenda. We've got a, a public hearing briefing discussion and likely vote on the curb ramp uh, requirements that many of you are familiar with um, that will result in bringing the city into compliance with the ADA. Um, we'll have a public hearing and vote on the South Lake Union design guidelines, which we heard a little bit about at our last committee discussion. Ditto uh, public meeting and discussion and vote on the moratorium that we passed last year related to a development of certain types of land uses on the uh, Aurora Licton Springs Urban Village. And then further discussion and vote on the resolution related to the UW Major Institution Master Plan. Um, if we've got time, we'll also have a little bit of discussion at the end about the proposed uh, tree regulations that we've been talking about. That timeline has uh, been pushed off till post-budget. So if we've gotten through those first four agenda items, we'll save a little bit of time at the end to talk about sort of the continued direction that we're getting from the community about trees. But if we've run out of time, we'll have to put that one off to our final discussions um, after the final committee discussions after the uh, budget has concluded. 
One uh, just small piece of information from my colleagues related to my work at Sound Transit. Folks may have seen that um, the Capitol Committee meeting last Thursday, we took a proactive vote on a couple of Seattle-related projects. Um, early investments in the 130th station uh, has been something that this table has talked about a lot. Um, and at the Capitol Committee meeting last week, we took an affirmative vote to allow for some preliminary engineering of that station at the 130th station to uh, potentially be open at the same time as the extension to Linwood. No promises there, but we're, the early engineering work gives us uh, framework uh, by which future Sound Transit board action could be possible. And then uh, secondarily, we also authorized the um, Sound Transit uh, staff to do some work with the uh, consultant team to advance capital investments on rapid ride C and D, which are part of the early wins package of ST3. So that work is going to get underway this year in the hopes that we can make those capital investments starting in 2020. So um, good stuff coming out of Sound Transit that I wanted to make sure that didn't slip under the radar. That's it for me. Excellent. Thank you, Councilman Johnson. Councilman Gonzalez. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we have one item on today's full council agenda that is related to the Gender, Gender Equity, Safe Communities, New Americans, and Education Committee. It is Resolution 31816. And that's a resolution from our Office of Emergency Management. It is um, a basic resolution that updates four elements of the City of Seattle's Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan. And I'll talk about that, uh, comp the components of that resolution a little bit more during uh, full council today. But um, this is a standard piece of legislation that is required um, by OEM to do every year to make sure that uh, the city of Seattle is in compliance with its emergency management requirements and obligations. Um, we have a committee hearing scheduled. It's a special meeting uh, scheduled for tomorrow, Tuesday, September 18th at 12 p.m. here in council chambers. There are five items on the agenda for the meeting. Uh, we will be considering the appointment and reappointment of three individuals to the Se Seattle Fire Code Advisory Board. We will then hear an update from the Office of Immigrant Refugee Affairs on our Legal Defense Network Fund. And then finally, we will hear from the Department of Human Resources as they present um, on their Workforce Equity Accountability Report uh, to the committee. And then I uh, wanted to just really quickly pass around uh, these proclamations that we will be presenting at um, today's, do you want me to go this way first? Sure. Um, that we'll be presenting at uh, full council this afternoon. So these are two proclamations to recognize more um, awesome people doing good things in sports. It seems like that's been like the theme over the last <laughs> um, few months. Um, so not a lot of folks know that uh, we have two uh, teams here. One is a women's team, one is a co-ed team um, related to Ultimate, formerly known as Ultimate Frisbee. And so these are two proclamations to recognize the good work of and the accomplishments of Seattle Riot and Seattle BFG. Seattle Riot was undefeated at the 2018 WCC, um, and uh, they actually uh, won their competition in undefeated um, uh, uh, tournament in that case. And then Seattle BFG had a, a similar story. And so we will have members from both of those teams present this afternoon at two o'clock to accept the proclamations and um, appreciate your all's willingness to sign the proclamation. And this is a joint proclamation with, um, with the mayor, of course. And then um, just really quickly wanted to give an update on uh, for those of you who may have been receiving some correspondence. My office has been getting a lot of contact from members of the Central District uh, related to some uh, incidents of gun violence that have been occurring within the Central District. Uh, in particular, uh, we have seen that in the last, since about the end of August, there has been probably about 10 uh, shootings um, in that particular part of town. Um, wanted to let folks know that I've been in contact with the Seattle Police Department, both Chief Best and Deputy Chief uh, Garth Green, to have them walk uh, my office through uh, what they are doing in response to those particular incidents. I've received about a dozen uh, inquiries from constituents related to this. Want to make sure that folks understand that we are aware of the issue, we understand what the problem is, and that the Seattle Police Department Department is prioritizing its resources to make sure that we continue to keep folks in that neighborhood um, safe. Also want to make sure folks understand that these are not random acts of gun violence. They are uh, targeted um, acts of uh, gun violence and um, 
and the police department is marshalling its resources in a manner to make sure that we address this in a regional way because these are regional issues when we're talking about gun violence in this particular um, city. And uh, also just wanna make sure that folks understand that we will be um, uh, working with the police department as they curate a list of what are referred to as violence interrupters, organizations that community members can engage with if they're interested in um, taking um, some time to engage in some harm reduction approaches to really uh, figure out how to create some social cohesion within their communities to interrupt these acts of uh, violence through means that don't always include calling 911. But for now, the police department is asking that folks um, call 911 if they see actions that cause them concern in their neighborhoods, not just descriptors of people, but actual actions and behaviors that are uh, concerning to them to please call 911. That is um, helpful to them to figure out how to make sure that they need to continue to, to, to dedicate resources to this space. But I wanna make sure folks understand that um, the police department has taken this very seriously and I'm continuing to make sure to work with them to ensure that I can get as much accurate information out to constituents who are contacting our office on this public safety issue. You know, Councilmember Gonzalez, I really appreciate you raising the issue and, and assuring the public that uh, the police are getting as much intel as possible and trying to um, trying to protect us uh, in the best way possible. And I do know that often when there um, when this violence sort of erupts, there's things happening in the community that at least someone in in an office in City Hall wouldn't just wouldn't, we wouldn't have a clue as to what's going on out there. But there are a lot of community organizations like even the NWCP and other organizations that really know, sometimes knows the families and what's happening out there in terms of the um, um, who's, who's doing what. And so all of that, working with all these families and all these people to, to understand what's going on is very helpful. Not just, uh, not just the police, but all these community organizations. So I appreciate your comments. Yeah, one of the things that Deputy Chief um, Garth Green mentioned to me today is that they um, have contacted some of those um, community-based organizations to engage them in um, helping to make contact with some of the families who um, they know uh, may have touch points with what is happening in this particular area. So I appreciate their holistic approach to not only take the um, public safety concerns seriously through the law enforcement lens, but they are also looking at some of the more comprehensive holistic strategies to make sure that uh, the faith community and community-based organizations like the NAACP are connecting with families to, again, uh, make sure parents know what are happening, what's happening, and to see if there's a way to just um, bring down the temperature in, in the neighborhood to reduce the number of incidents of uh, shots fired. Yeah, Councilman Shawan. I just wanted to say that uh, my office has been contacted by a lot of uh, constituents about this and we are responding to them. But I also think the discussion here is, on, is along good lines that you know, we, not everything can be solved by um, increasing police presence, that there needs to be other social uh, factors that need to be considered. And I also uh, agree that as far as we know, these are not random acts of violence. These are gang related and and I agree with Councilmember Gonzalez that the that that makes it a regional question and that we should approach it responsibly in that manner so I appreciate what you said yeah Thank and you. I've I've I have high confidence in the the briefing as a result of the briefing that I got this morning that um, they are definitely looking at this as a regional approach and are uh, absolutely committed to having a holistic approach here to try to figure out how to leverage existing community resources, which are frankly limited in this space, to um, again intervene and interrupt some of these cycles to prevent additional shots fired. So, for any any folks who want um, more information, I encourage them to reach out to my office. Uh, and we will get them as much information as we can that is, um, you know, not sensitive information. Thank you. Very good. Councilmember Herbold. Thank you and good morning. Good morning. Um, what we've got going on uh, in full council coming out of Creta today is uh, 
a whole bunch of appointments. We've got one appointment to the Music Commission, one appointment and one reappointment to the Seattle Arts Commission. We have five appointments to the Human Rights Commission, three appointments to the LGBTQ Commission, and one appointment to the People with Disabilities Commission. Uh, in addition to that, we are bringing forward um, from committee to full council the Domestic Workers Anti-Discrimination, Harassment and Retaliation Bill. If you recall, this legislation extends the recourse that is available through the Office of Civil Rights um, enforcement against those types of actions that um, are discriminatory, um, uh, har harassing in their nature or retaliation, um, and allows the Office of uh, Civil Rights to investigate um, and enforce our laws um, against those activities in those instances when um, the actions are being taken against domestic workers who are independent contractors. So this is going to be um, a new addition to the Fair Employment Practices section of the Municipal Code. And um, basically, uh, it covers a, a number of different um, uh, changes, but um, the, the upshot is, is, as I said, it allows the Office of Civil Rights to um, enforce the law that already exists for regular employees um, prohibiting these, these types of actions. And it, it, it's really important because um, without the ability to enforce um, the law against retaliation, um, it really hampers the ability to um, bring forward the important changes that have been made through Councilmember Moscada's Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. People have to be able to use the law um, without fear of retaliation. So it's um, a pleasure to have been able to um, sort of tie up that last little piece. Um, I appreciate Councilman Mosqueda's leadership. There is one amendment at full council that we'll be discussing related to this, this bill. The legislation was written with the standard 30-day implementation period. Um, upon further discussion, it became clear that it would be important to have this legislation align with Councilman Mosqueda's legislation, have them both go into effect at the same time. Um, that uh, will make it easier for um, the Office of um, Labor Standards to work with the Office of uh, Civil Rights to, um, to do the education and outreach necessary for implementation of this law. So it, the amendment itself changes the implementation date to July of 2019. Again, this is to align with the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights. Um, we have a couple meetings uh, for, the, for my committee, the Civil Rights, Utilities, Economic Development, and Arts Committee this week, um, two of them. One uh, will be a public hearing at 6 p.m. on Wednesday that I hope folks can make. Uh, this is a public hearing um, on the legislation that uh, we had already passed to create a 10-month period to study the expansion of the Pike Place Market Historic District to include the Showbox site. Under state law, uh, a public hearing is required within 60 days of passage of the ordinance. Sign up will begin at 5.30 p.m., but the um, public hearing itself will start at 6. Um, in addition, we have a special meeting um, of the committee on Friday. We are beginning at 9 a.m. We have a lot of business to take care of before we go into, bus uh, into, into budget. Um, on the agenda on Friday, at 9 a.m. is um, an appointment to the Arts Commission, re review of the use of funding for, um, for film approved by the council in last year's budget uh, for the Office of Film and Music. Um, and we're um, gonna be, again, a, a number of appointments that we'll be bringing forward um, on Friday, but that I'm gonna be walking on to today's full council agenda. Uh, or full, the, today's full council um, uh, introduction and referral calendar. Um, so there'll be a number of those. Also at the committee meeting, we're gonna have um, a second discussion and vote on two pieces of legislation related to Seattle Public Utilities. One relates to the water system plan and the other relates to um, the drainage and wastewater rates. This week, um, I have um, uh, attendance at uh, Regional Transit Committee. Um, I also have office hours this Wednesday, uh, I'm sorry, this Friday, uh, between uh, 1 and 6 p.m. at the South Park Community Center. And as far as uh, major events going on this week, uh, I too will be attending the Real Change Breakfast tomorrow morning. Um, and um, 
also wanted to make uh, an announcement regarding the Hugo House reopening, which is happening on Saturday um, from 5 to 10 p.m. Um, finally, at the, um, the culmination of a multi-year capital campaign where they've raised $7.5 million, um, they're going to be opening this fantastic new space, 10,000 square feet, 150-person um, performance space, and a new writer's salon. So this is going to be a really um, fantastic uh, new part of our literary scene. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman Herbold. Very interesting. Thank you very much. So we're going to move into a briefing uh, from our waterfront folks, and Councilman Juarez was going to tee it up. But Councilman Beckshaw, you said some introductory remarks already. Did you want to, as they approach us, would you like to say a little more about the waterfront lid activities? Thank you. Um, I want to welcome everybody back. Uh, the local improvement district, of course, is something that we have been planning since 2004 that having additional resources available to do what I call the sizzle on the steak, which is the good stuff that we'll all be seeing on top of the waterfront. And I am now free through our wonderful Office of Ethics to be able to participate in these discussions. Um, but I do have to continue to say every time I have a condo, my husband and I ha own a condo just a couple of blocks from the waterfront. So I will be involved in paying this tax if it passes. And I am very pleased to participate in this. So thank you very much. So before we start an introduction, let me just, maybe I could give a little more context. So we have an over, we've asked the hearing examiner, of course, to conduct the hearing process. And I don't know if many of you have the, you should have the report in your prep materials. There's also a frequently asked questions document if you want me to pass this down. But there's been an overwhelming amount of uh, uh, comments, uh, many opposed, some for, and we thought it appropriate, I believe this council member, <coughs> where it's thought it appropriate in light of the overwhelming uh, number of comments for us to be able to ask the hearing examiner and his his uh, uh, other folks questions about where we are in this process. So with that, why don't we start with introductions. Monica Martinez-Simmons, City Clerk. Ryan Vansel, Hearing Examiner. Good morning, Joshua Curtis with the Office of the Waterfront and Civic Projects. Marshall Foster, Office of the Waterfront and Civic Projects. Okay, how would you like to proceed? Uh, I've been asked to give short, a brief overview of the hearing program, and essentially what I'll be doing is simply walking through the report, and uh, a good morning to President Council and the rest of the Council. So I'll just be walking through the report. If you have it with you, you can follow through or, or just listen. This is a summary of a summary, essentially. The um, report is formed uh, following a formation hearing and the formation uh, is the only subject of the hearing as, as you may have been briefed by uh, your legal counsel or uh, others there are additional processes you'll be facing through the LID formation uh, after the LID formation. Uh, the opportunity for the formation hearing is to give members of the public an opportunity to come forward and appear and fully vet essentially and share their opinions on the LID and why uh, and what they think about it. And I think it's fair to say that the process that was provided by the city was, uh, in my opinion, exemplary. I, I'm not patting myself on the back. I was asked to join as the hearing examiner overseeing the process, uh, the public side of the process. Um, but behind me was a, a team of support from the waterfront uh, committee and the uh, the uh, clerk's office that I found it, it, it was a, a real treat to work with them and extremely uh, supportive that I, I was stepping into uh, a, a fully uh, operating uh, system that really provided an excellent opportunity for any individual who wanted to voice their opinion about the LID to come forward and speak. We had a series of days, a full day, uh, Friday, July 13th, and then two evenings on, the, on July 17 and 18, and then a Saturday morning hearing as well. I don't know the total hours, but uh, multiple days of hearing. 
Very good. Thank you, <laughs> Councilmember Bagshaw. So, um, and we were there from beginning to end. Uh, we noticed it as the times that are shown here. So we didn't just start, and if nobody else came, uh, we uh, were there the whole time, ready for anyone to come in. And frequently, what we had were individuals coming in at the beginning in a small group and uh, or, or a cluster, and then uh, over the course of the hearing, we'd see a few more uh, come in as well. So they got the, the full treatment, as, as it were, of with uh, coming into particularly over at the convention center, which, which was the whole first day. And there, there were information tables to discuss and, and tell them about the LID. There were opportunities to file protests, to f submit written comments. And then finally, if they also wanted to make a uh, oral statement, they could do that before me. All of the oral and written public comments submitted during the, the comment period from July 13 to 31 are summarized in the report. And this is just a summary. So you could, you could look to the stack of comments at any time if you want to get a little bit uh, deeper dive. Uh, those are an attachment that were supplied with the, re supply, uh, supplied with the report. And um, when the speakers came forward, the uh, opportunity they had, there was really no limit put on written comment. So if you wanted to submit a comment, they came in by email, they came in by letter, uh, they came in by uh, sort of a petition, as it were, with someone who uh, had formed a statement that everyone signed on to. We also had uh, a lot of email comments, and they ranged anything from the uh, simply, no, I don't want the lid, a uh, single comment up to well thought out letters uh, with multiple points in them. Many of the points were thematic in the written comments that matched also the oral comments. And so if council wanted to go beyond the summary here, I, I, one suggestion I would give you is if you could look in the comments and simply look for a long letter, you're probably finding one that reflects the other comments to some degree and uh, gives you a bit more depth than the summary that I'm providing here. For those that were speaking orally, uh, originally we set it at two minutes was going to be the opportunity to speak. Uh, but because we didn't have large numbers of individuals showing up at any one time, essentially what they were provided was unlimited time. I, I gave them the opportunity to speak for two minutes. And then if it appeared that they hadn't finished their, their statement or something along the, those lines, they were encouraged to finish whatever statement they had. In addition to that, after uh, any particular group that was there uh, had spoken, I asked if anyone had not had an opportunity to finish their statements or to share their opinions. And and uh, generally, the case was not the case that they had more to share. But if they did, they came forward and shared that. And so there was ample opportunity for individuals to come forward and, and share orally uh, what they uh, had to say, as well as unlimited opportunity for uh, written comment. We received a total of 330 com 33 comments during the official comment period. There were some that came outside of that, which I did not consider. This is not a quasi-judicial process so much, but it is relatively formal. So I thought it was important that comments that came in during that time be the, one that were, be the ones that were respected and uh, were included in the summary. Our, we got a total during the oral hearings. Some people submitted written comments during that, but the oral comments were 69, uh, 56 written comments during that. And then outside of that, the emails and such that I mentioned, there were 208 of those. That's a general uh, summary of, of the experience that speakers uh, had and, and written comments and, and how it was set up. Um, we also, that I'll go into just giving a very brief overview of some of the comments and then I'd love to get to any questions that you have. If you uh, look at the, again, this is a summary of comments, so I'll give a, a brief summary of that. And um, I think it's, it, what I'll try to do here is just touch on the ones that I think were thematic, essentially, that the commenters, I heard the same comments from many, many speakers as opposed to a few. Uh, I think um, it was clear that there was some coordination among speakers and those who were providing written comments, so there were themes within it. Um, sometimes, as I mentioned, they were actually uh, prepared as, as comments that were simply signed on by individuals. So I think that did reflect some coordination in those that were opposed uh, and, and for, in fact. Um, those that were opposed did express support for the city's proposed improvements, but expressed m mainly a concern about their perception of unfairness uh, being responsible for paying for the improvements of the LID. And I should take a step back just a moment and remind you too that 
I, I'm presenting a summary. Uh, these are the comments of the individuals who came forward, and I took it as my duty to uh, share those as objectively as I could with counsel, and they don't represent my opinions or anyone from the waterfront, but it's the, the, I think that they needed essentially a good, clear conveyance of what their opinions were, and that's what this was an attempt at. <coughs> Many commenters indicated they believe the LID process is to fund a park that serves the entire city and tourists, and so they were concerned about them having to pay for it. Um, they they believed that that was uh, unfair when they were others were many others were benefiting from it, and um, not just them. Mosqueda? Quick question. Oh, I have to grab my. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was a good one. Oh, okay. Let me. It's that area. I don't know if something's going on right here in the middle of the table. Um, so th I guess that's my biggest question. I, I see from your Q&A document that there has been an effort to do a similar type funding mechanism repeatedly um, from city council. And I can't find the list in front of us, but you did give us a list of all of the various places that this type of funding mechanism has been done in the past. What is the specific controversy this time around? Is there a different ratio of funding of residents, business owners, um, et cetera, or why is this one? Thank you. Just for the public's reference, the city has formed numerous lids over the years, including South Lake Union Streetcar, Third Avenue Transit Tunnel, Aurora Bridge, Magnolia Bridge, and the Denny Regrade. Um, so why is this one seeming to raise concerns? Um, is it a difference in ratio or formula, or is this just because this is my first time experiencing it and it's been like this the whole time? And so, I should say, that's a, a small portion of the concerns I heard. We also heard a number of individuals coming forward to express support, especially from our friends the, who are the friends of the waterfront and others. So I uh, just wondered for historical context if you can give me that comparison. And so, Council Member, um, my role in this was very limited. Um, I was essentially the MC face for the formation hearing, and and then to file the report, um, much of the data and report, and even the formation of the hearing and how it was put together, and the history behind it is is better put to the waterfront committee. Um, so I was just providing you the summary for this report, what was actually said by the individuals at it, and I think that'd be better directed at Marshall and his folks. Yeah, Council Member, uh, fair question. I'm happy to speak to that a little bit. So. I think the, the essence of that concern has been, while yes, the city has formed LIDs um, many times, council has taken actions to form LIDs in the majority, almost all of the cases of them being formed in Seattle. This is the first time we have used it to fund a park as opposed to a piece of transportation infrastructure or a bridge or a utility. Um, that said, and you know we've discussed this uh, quite a bit with our stakeholders. You know, state law explicitly allows the use of LIDs to help fund parks. And in this case, you know, part of what's unique and important about the context for how we're funding the waterfront is that the state and city funding, um, hundreds of millions of dollars, is funding the basic infrastructure elements, which otherwise could be funded by an LID. But in the case of the waterfront, we thought those elements, those, the city and state money should fund the basic infrastructure to make the park possible. Without those underlying investments, there's not a space to create that park. So it's really all part of that whole package. But that's really what's unique here is the, the use of it for a park. Just mention once again, how much money has come in from the state through WashDOT, how much money that we put in through our parks, Metropolitan Park Improvement District. Can you just do a quick summary on that? Sure, so the state has a couple different ways they're funding the waterfront. The largest obviously is the deep bore tunnel and the viaduct demolition. That's in the billions of dollars, depending on how you wanna do the math. More specifically to the Waterfront Seattle program that our office manages, uh, they've funded $153 million for the replacement of Alaskan Way and the construction of the new uh, Elliott Way, which is essentially all the surface transportation along the waterfront. And then our budget, again, we have uh, a host of different funds, but it's, it's a little over $200 million in the total in terms of the funds that are going into the transportation infrastructure, as well as the utility replacements and upgrades that are part of City Light and SPU's budget on the waterfront. 200 million seawall that was voted on by the public. 
Yes, this, the, the public voted on a $290 million seawall bond measure. Um, and then there was you know, city and county money on top of that that all helped to make the seawall uh, reconstruction possible. So the, the scale of the, of the leveraging, if you look at it as a package, you, know, you have a total program that is close to a billion dollars of just local money. Then you have all of the state money um, over and above that that's leveraging the, the proposed $200 million LID. Any other? Well, we I, have warranted a lot more discussion, I suppose. Uh, Councilmember Gonzalez, just let me ask one question, and I'll defer to sure. your, your question. So there's one bullet comment, and I think you sort of addressed it, but I'm just trying to see if this math is incorrect, and I think you're suggesting it is. So the bullet point is on page 6 of 16. It's the bottom one. It says, so the project is marketed at $696 million project with the lid landowners within the lid paying $200 million. This is misleading because the lid project improvements only cost $324 million, and the landowners are expected to foot $200 million of that cost, with the city only providing $40 million. Therefore, this project, I'm saying therefore, therefore the project is inequitable. So is that sort of the, yeah, how that, would you respond that to that? Goes how back, should we respond to that? Yeah, council member, that goes back to the point I was, I was trying to get at before. So the, the waterfront program that the city manages is at 696, approximately $700 million total. That's really the whole package. When we talk about the 324 with the public, the number that's referenced there, that is, there's, there's a set of specific projects that the lid itself helps to fund, and that's that piece. But without the larger context, so without the city and the state essentially taking down the viaduct, building the new Alaskan Way, relocating all the utilities out of the park spaces, we don't have any ability to create that new park. So it really is one package at that 700, and we've always talked about it that way. Right. Um, so I think that's kind of the, a little bit of the confusion that's, that's in that comment. Right. Councilmember Gonzalez? I withdraw my question. I'm sorry, are you withdraw? I'm withdrawing my question. So um, you're, 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 you're just here for Q&A at this point. There's no more introductory uh, conversation. You know, the, in many ways, the report can certainly speak for itself. Speak for itself. I, um, in, in, my role was, I think, as designated by council, was to be neutral. So I, I, to be I neutral. always report on it. So, so you probably want to get at the meat of it with the uh, Waterfront Committee. So at this point, and I, this conversation has actually been occurring for since 2012 or so, since the first mention of a lid and how we are to fund this um, sort of landmark project. It's been controversial since 2012. I think we all could concede that. So can you walk us through when you, the overwhelm, let's just be very transparent here. The overwhelming amount of con comments are opposed to the lid, correct? Numerically speaking. Yes. And the substance of them are and so we, so what do we, where do we go from here? Let me just ask that question. What, what, what is procedurally, uh, Marsha, maybe walk us through the process. Um, and quite candidly, I never met anyone that's just really eager to pay taxes. And so, I mean, to some extent, this isn't a total surprise, but sort of walk us through what we do this, particularly as we approach the budget season. Are there um, ideas we should come up with? Do we do more? process. Uh, walk me through how you would advise us moving forward in light of uh, sure. this process. Yes, happy to do that. So this builds directly on the council action, the resolution of intent to form the LID. And so that process by state law, you know, triggered this more formal public hearing process that the hearing examiner has helped facilitate. Um, that's in addition to all the other public outreach that we've talked, that we talk about in this FAQ, uh, which has been going on for, for a number of years. The next step, council member, is that the executive will be submitting to council uh, legislation to form the local improvement district. And so under the state process, um, these comments are intended to inform your deliberation on that. That's essentially how they're how it is set up. So when that legislation comes down, which is imminent, I would say that will be coming to you, you know, within the next month to six weeks, I would say something like that. Um, you will have the opportunity in your discussion of this, again, at the dais, as we just review it publicly, to have, the, the, have that informed by these comments and sort of a, a sense of where the property owner community stands. That's really what this is intended to do. And let me give an example. Let's say I'm a property owner and I'm paying 75,000 in property taxes a year right now. 
uh, it's going to increase because of the lid. The actual math, the increase that I will pay is, is, is that, has that been made known to their, their actual increase has been made known? Yes, it has. Yes, it has. So for um, a number of months now, I'm going to go back to, I believe it was it April or May when it first came out, the, it was the actual May. assessments. Yeah. So we published um, in, the, in that whole series of outreach in May an actual draft, what we called a preliminary assessment role. So each property could look up the specifics of what their assessment might be. And because they have the potential assessment, is there an appeal process as there are, generally speaking, for those individuals or businesses during this process? Yes, there is. There's actually two steps of uh, protest or appeal. So I mentioned the ordinance coming to council. If that is approved, there is a 30-day window where there can be a protest of the formation of the ordinance as, as a whole, the formation of the LID as a whole. And then if uh, the LID ordinance withstands that protest period and it moves forward next year, we'll be back at council to actually do the, what's called the final assessment role. So if council acts this fall, then our appraiser updates his special benefits study. So he takes another look at all the properties to make sure we haven't made any errors. He considers new information, buildings which have been completed since the draft was done earlier this year, and puts out a final special benefits study. Then that becomes the final assessment role. You would have the opportunity to approve that. We expect probably, uh, no, you know, sometime next year, we're working on the specifics of that right now. And then, if that final assessment role is approved by council, there is the individual <coughs> appeal. So a property owner, this is getting to your specific question, if, the proper, if a property owner comes forward and says, hey, despite all this process, we still believe in our property there was an error made or they didn't consider X, Y, or Z factor, they can make a specific appeal to the council to make that change. So there's, numerous, there's several different steps where they can, they can uh, object through this. much their property tax is if they believe that the assessment is wrong? Not directly to the assessor. The King County assessor isn't directly involved. There are some programs that we've been helping promote to property owners through this where the, the assessor can actually, you know, he can, uh, I don't want to say waive, but he can adjust some property taxes on, you know, for seniors and others in particular situations in the city. Those are programs run by the county. Um, but he, the assessor does not directly weigh in on the LID assessments. But uh, individual properties, if they feel like their tax, it's wrong with the, if the taxes are simply too high or it doesn't compare with their neighbors or whatever, they still go back to the assessor for that. Yes, if it's a general, general yeah. concern. Yeah. Yeah. And we have a, had a few property owners through this process have realized that maybe the data on the King County Assessor database was wrong. Is it, they've been actually able to go back and change that. And if I may, uh, Marshall, I just want to confirm, I didn't hear you mention in your process, but I, I think that there is another, there's the final assessment confirmation hearing. So there is another hearing that the council. Correct, would thank you. Yeah, that's true. Uh, council President, if I may just ask one more question here. So what I'm hearing from the, the comments that came to you is, there was not an objection so much to the actual project as to the way that this was being funded by the LID. I think that's a very fair summary of the majority of the opposing comments that I heard. Yes. That's, that strikes me too as accurate based upon what we're seeing from my office. Almost every, every sentence starts off with, I'm not objecting to the project. I want the project to go forward. I just don't think it's fair in the way that the, I'm being charged. Okay, well, um, any other comments or questions? Just, just wanted to get this issue in front of us as we deliberate. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Council President. I just, um, Marshall, I wanted to circle back to a comment that you made um, in your summary of the process moving forward. One of the things you said is that the executive will be shaping a proposal for city council's consideration. Um, that will presumably also take into account some of the uh, comments and feedback that was um, gathered through the hearing examiner process. Um, and one of the things that we had made sure to incorporate 
in the legislation through council member Juarez's committee was this component around potential proposals for mitigation related to um, uh, specific types of um, homeowners and circumstances that might uh, impose a burden upon them financially uh, to, to participate in the LID. I just want to make sure that we're still on track for receiving a proposal related to mitigation. If perhaps you can talk a little bit more, I'm not asking you to get ahead of the mayor. I'm just, <laughs> I'm asking you to just sort of give us a little bit more information for the viewing public and for ourselves in terms of, um, of the work on that particular component. That's absolutely, uh, council member, uh, an element of the proposal. So the, the deferrals and things that are allowed under state law. Joshua, do you want to describe them? Yeah, so there are detail? several types of deferrals. And I should remind everyone that um, the majority, if not all, of low-income housing, uh, primarily those who have relationships either with HUD or with our Office of Housing, although they are not exempt, uh, they are naturally occurring zero benefit just because of all the prohibitions or the regulatory um, issues that they have around trying to redevelop. Um, so those are sort of set aside. Uh, and then there are several state low-income housing or, or um, senior low-income um, uh, persons with disabilities uh, and, and uh, veteran-related deferrals, those are already in place. Um, and so really just a, a homeowner who qualified for that would just need to reach out to the state. And we have a link on our website to that. Um, there is an additional uh, economic hardship deferral, and I think that's what you're mm -hmm. referring to. Um, so that allows a um, family or person who meet a certain income qualification could receive up to two years of a deferral. It's really important to note that that is a deferral. They still have to pay for it, um, uh, but it is for people who are experiencing economic hardship. So loss of a family member, loss of a job. Uh, we will be bringing that forward, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And it's spread over 20 years. Uh, it, people have the option. It's a, it's a one-time assessment, and so you can either pay it up, all of it right up front, or you do have the option to actually pay it off over 20 years, and there are some finance-related charges that would be on top of that. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for being here. More work to come, and thanks for being available for the briefing, Right. Thank you, Council. Appreciate thank it you. Very much. Okay, as presiding officer, I'm now announcing that the Seattle Council will now convene an executive session, and the purpose of this executive session is to discuss pending, potential, or actual litigation, and the Council's executive sessions are an opportunity for the Council to discuss confidential legal matters with city attorneys as authorized by law. A legal monitor from the city attorney's office always is always present to ensure that we reserve questions of policy for open sessions. I expect this executive session to last 45 minutes. It's 10.40, so what will that be? There's my economist. 11.40, 11 what? 11.25. And if it goes beyond that time, I'll announce the extension and the expected duration. With that, please secure the room. 